We could dive into the Chargers. We could dive into the Raiders. And we had a lot to talk about. Marcus Mariota pretty much had to come in after the first quarter and played the majority of this game. And you know what? He played well. He did play well. Now, ultimately, yes, the Chargers wound up winning this game in overtime, 30-27. to 27. But it wasn't because of Marcus Mariota. He came in 17-28, 226 yards, had a touchdown, had an interception. Used his legs, 88 yards, and a touchdown on the ground. Before you even ask me the question, yes, Marcus Mariota will be a streaming option next week. Now, I know this game may have knocked out any chance the Raiders had of making the playoffs, and that's going to be interesting to watch when it comes to Josh Jacobs. Now, they gave Jacobs the ball a lot in this game. He ran the ball 26 times. Only 76 yards. He did get the rushing touchdown, and he also tacked on three receptions for 38 yards on three targets. However, he picks up a knee injury during the game. Now, he was able to play through it, and they still fed him the ball. But if you're going to be out of the playoffs, Josh Jacobs has been dealing with injuries quite a bit. Just next week will be very interesting. The one thing that bodes well for fantasy owners who wind up in the championship and have Josh Jacobs the one thing that bodes well for you is that at least he will have a 10-day period off after doing the Thursday game. So I do think there's a decent chance here that Josh Jacobs will be able to still be available to you guys for your championship weeks. And he winds up with a solid game here to kick things off. Now, the big winner of the day, of course, was Darren Waller. Nine catches, 150 yards, a touchdown, clearly the favorite target of Marcus Mariota. He had 12 targets on the day. Nelson Aguilar, again, had the targets in this one. Eight targets, only four catches for 49 yards, though. He didn't get that big play, which is kind of what he's been dependent upon in order to have those big fantasy returns. But again, another game in which Nelson Aguilar has, shows you he has a little bit of a floor. So he's not as boomer bust as he used to be. He still leads the way in targets. Hunter Renfro went down with an injury during this game. and They didn't have uh, Henry Ruggs available in this one to start with. So pretty, it pretty much boiled down to you had Darren Waller, you had Nelson Aguilar, and you had Josh Jacobs on the ground. They tried to utilize that. The offensive line didn't play great in this game for the Raiders. But dear Lord, could you make it any more obvious when you were going to run the ball to Josh Jacobs? And when you did run the ball with Josh Jacobs, can, is he allowed to run to any other gap besides the A or B gap? No stretch runs, only two tosses. Both went for losses of four or five yards, I believe. Everything they did was just smack into the middle behind the center. Smack into the middle behind the center. And the Chargers were sitting there with eight, nine guys in the boxes waiting for it every single time. Every single time. So that's where it's been tough. Now, on the Chargers side of things, Justin Herbert, if you stuck with him, he came through a few for a decent day. Not a huge day, but a decent day. 314 yards, two touchdowns, and a rushing touchdown. That's the, start, that's the kind of start you want out of your quarterback in your fantasy football playoff matchups. Now, I had Justin Herbert ranked at QB 13. I didn't have him as a must start because we didn't know what we were going to have out of a Keenan Allen, out of a Mike Williams heading into the matchup. And you know what? We didn't have much out of them at all. We did not have much out of them at all. All Keenan Allen, one catch, 17 yards on three targets. Now, he was out there throughout the game. But it was clear he was there to be more of a decoy than anything else. I mean, it was, it was Jalen Guyton who had four receptions for 91 yards and six targets. It was Hunter Henry who had five catches for 65 yards and a touchdown in this game. And then Tyron Johnson, who wound up coming through as a sleeper after all, even though both Keenan Allen and Mike Williams were activated, three catches, 61 yards, and a touchdown. He was able to spread the ball out to everybody. He almost looked like a more complete quarterback, realizing he didn't have to throw the ball to Keenan Allen all the time. It's kind of interesting how that works out sometimes. Now, this was a Raiders defense with no Jonathan Abram that had no answer for the pass all night long. Anytime Justin Herbert dropped back to pass, he had all day long to decide where he wanted to go with the ball, and guys coming wide open all over the place. So things are going to look a little bit better against defenses like this to begin with. But if you stuck with Justin Herbert, you were rewarded. Austin Eckler, 13 carries, 60 yards. Didn't do anything. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say he didn't do anything. Didn't do much 
in the receiving game. Only four catches, 19 yards on four targets. But the four targets is what shocks me. It was a back-and-forth game. Justin Herbert was throwing the ball well. Keaton Allen is a decoy. Mike Williams is a decoy. I thought for sure of nothing else. We knew Hunter Henry would probably get his, but I thought for sure of nothing else, Austin Eckler would be targeted a ton because he has been anyway. They didn't do that in this game. So if you're Eckler owner, you won't pretty disappointed. Pretty much if you stuck with Justin Herbert, you were rewarded because other than being a Hunter Henry owner and streaming him, none of the charges that you depended upon to get you to this point really came through for you in this one. And hopefully you'll be able to survive it. But Keenan Allen getting one reception for 17 yards if you played him against the Raiders, that's going to be difficult to do. And I still had him ranked. I dropped him down the rankings before that game happened. I saw him ranked as a wide receiver too, though. Like, it's Keenan Allen. He's going to be active against the Raiders. You have to play him. You can't blame yourself. That's one of those that if you ultimately wind up losing this week, you can't blame yourself because of it. Jets and the Rams. We just got some news before the show really started, actually, that James Crowder was able to practice on a limited capacity. Still has the calf issue. Sounds like he'll be able to play. Will be listed as questionable heading into the weekend. And this is how much I care for fantasy football purposes. No. You're not playing a New York Jet against the Rams with the defense that they've been playing with as of late, which has been a top-notch defense, an elite defense. Not with Sam Darnold, scrubby Sam Darnold, scrubby Adam Gase. There's not a fantasy-relevant player because even the running back situation, Adam Gase is like, yeah, yeah, we'll have a four-man rotation of a bunch of bums and practice squad guys. Why not? Nothing on the Jets is worth your time, but what you can do is play against them. Rams defense, one of the top defenses you could possibly have for fantasy football purposes this particular week. You can Jared Goff as QB 10 for me. He's a guy you can consider streaming and being a top 12 quarterback for you this week. Cam Akers is an RB1 in my rankings. I have an RB6 overall. Cooper Cup, wide receiver 17. Robert Woods, wide receiver 14. High end wide receiver twos. The only thing you can't really play is the tight end situation because they just haven't been very involved consistently regardless of their opponent. The only thing I'm worried about from your Rams fantasy relevant players in this week's matchup is game script. That's it. That's the only thing I would be considered. I was the only thing I'd be concerned about. I wouldn't be concerned about anything else. Could the Rams just flat out decide that they are going to win this game, dominate this game with Cam Akers and the defense? kind of like what they did last week to the New England Patriots. Is that a possibility that something similar to that nature could happen? The answer is yes. The answer is unequivocally yes. So that's going to be the one concern you have when it comes to Jared Goff, when it comes to Cooper Cup, when it comes to Robert Woods, because you're going to want to play these guys against the Jets. You know, what the, you know how horrendous the Jets are against the passing attack. The Rams have looked pretty solid over the past few weeks in that, right? Sean McVay has them going more up-tempo, which has been helping out Jared Goff, has been helping out the volume of a Cooper Cup and a Robert Woods. But the issue here becomes, are they just going to win it through their game script, through their defense, through their running game? That's the only concern I have when it comes to a Cooper Cup, a Robert Woods, and a Jared Goff. Otherwise, you have to play these guys. Or Jared Goff's case, he's at least in the conversation if you're looking at the streaming quarterbacks available to you this week. But that's why Cam Akers is an RB1, because he's the one guy I'm looking at is, I don't care how this game script goes, whether the Rams are ahead, whether it's close, whatever the case may be, Cam Akers is going to be allowed to run because he would finally have clarity in this backfield of who the guy is. After last week, there's no, there's no question mark about it. There is no rotation. It's Cam Akers. And if Sean McVay were to go this Sunday and decide to rotate this back into a, a committee backfield, then I, you guys all have permission for me to throw eggs at him <laughs> at the press conference because that just can't happen at this point. There's no way. I'd be willing to bet whatever amount of money that you want to bet on that Cam Akers is going to be hands down the lead guy heading into this week's matchup. That's how confident we are now finally at this point. And that's a good thing. Because now you know what to count on.
So let's move off this game because it's pretty straightforward and what you're going to be doing from a fantasy standpoint. Let's talk about a game that might be a little bit more cloudy, might be a little bit more interesting. That's the Philadelphia Eagles and the Arizona Cardinals. Jalen Hurts is QB 16 for me. So he's in the streaming conversation, depending on what your options are available to you. And it's pretty, it's pretty simple. It's because of his legs. I wasn't really overly impressed with him throwing the football last week, but there was two things coming out of last week. One, the Eagles offense definitely looked a lot better with the game plan that they built around Jalen Hurts. And two, they building that game plan around Jalen Hurts using his legs to open things up. I mean, he ran for over 100 yards. He's going to use his legs. He's going to run for a lot again this game against the Arizona Cardinals. That will be for 100 yards. I'm not so sure. But will he have a high floor because of his scrambling ability? 100%. 100%. He'll be able to hit the tight ends like a Dallas Goddard, a Zach Ertz. Miles Sanders all of a sudden is popping back up on people's radars as a guy who could be a championship winner. If we get to see what he did against the Saints last week, continue with Jalen Hurts in the starting quarterback position. Now, the one thing I will say about last week, he still only had 14 carries, but he busted the big play. That's something that's not really super sustainable. What I want to see is I want to see Miles Sanders getting 18 carries plus four receptions plus. I want to see him getting 20 touches total because that's what he should be doing. That's what he's supposed to be doing. And if you have Jalen Hurts' legs, well, now the bad offensive line isn't as bad for Miles Sanders because now all of a sudden there's going to be holes, there's going to be opportunities available at the snap that weren't there with Carson Wentz. So Miles Sanders becomes very interesting. He's RB16 for me this week. While it's not a great matchup on paper, it's also nothing that scares you. I'm not scared of the Arizona run defense. So as long as they continue to use those RPO actions, I do believe Miles Sanders can be a very solid RB2 with some upside because he's hit a big play a couple times this season, including last week with Jalen Hurts. It might be there. Still can't touch the wide receivers for the Philadelphia Eagles. Again, like I said, still not overly impressed by Jalen Hurts throwing the football. This is a decent secondary for the Arizona Cardinals. And nobody has really been the guy. We had a we had a month stretch there of Travis Fulgham really kind of leading the way with all the targets. And that, mm, that really hasn't been there since. It really hasn't. It's been spread out between Greg Ward and Jalen Rager and Travis Fulgham. And now Alshon Jeffrey trying to get his work, his work back into the mix. He had a touchdown last week. It was only a reception of the day, but he had a touchdown last week. Rager's not even really getting hit down the field. Jalen Hurts is not a big arm guy. So you're not touching any of these wide receivers. Now the tight ends, on the other hand, obviously in the conversation, continue to play Dallas Goddard as the number one tight end, not just for the Philadelphia Eagles, but as a top 12 tight end in your fantasy football lineups. I know he didn't have a huge stat line last week or anything like that, but he still had the most targets in front of Zach Ertz there's still definitely a comfortability there. And I do believe that the security blanket when Jalen Hurts is looking to throw the football to, to move the chains, it's going to be Dallas Goddard. So I do think you can still play him as a tight end 11 because this offense, I believe, will now be more focused around Jalen Hurts using his legs. I do worry a little bit about overall passing volume. But that's where we get into the other side of the ball with the Arizona Cardinals and what are they going to be able to do offensively? Kyler Murray is my QB 11. Now, that means he's just inside the top 12. It means he's still just a QB 1. But man, oh, man, he's not playing well. And this Eagles defense is decent. Now, I don't know if they're going to have Darius Slay in this game, and that will affect things. That will be it will make it easier for Murray to be able to get the ball to DeAndre Hopkins. DeAndre Hopkins, who returned to practice today along with Chase Edmonds. They had not been in practice for most of the week up until this point, but they are going to practice today and are both expected to play. So nothing to be concerned about there. And if there is no Darius Slade, then Hopkins should have a really nice time. And even if there is, because Slade has been so banged up, he hasn't even really been a shutdown corner for these top wide receivers over the past few weeks anyway. So I like Hopkins in this game quite a bit because they have definitely made a recommitment to getting Hopkins the ball, to getting him the targets that, for some inexplicable reason, after Murray hurt his shoulder, they just weren't getting it to him. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. The squeaky wheel got the grease in DeAndre Hopkins' situation. 
So he's going to be good to go. I have him at wide receiver 10. So I have him right there at the wide receiver one position. 